Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach and teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level, to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. I have published dozens of episodes on this podcast on NDE, the afterlife, psychic phenomena, angels, consciousness, mediumship and channeling, as these are the topics of my interest and the core of the show. I am fairly knowledgeable in these subjects based on my own research and personal experience, plus all that I have learned from my guests so far. So at some point, I begin to think that there is really nothing new I could learn and bring on the show to my audience without repeating the same story, perhaps in a different context or from a different angle. So I waited for something special, for a story that will make my jaw drop. And I can tell you, that this is a tall order. <laughs> Until one day, not long ago, when watching Gaia, that's exactly what happened. The interview was riveting, gathering the momentum, and at one point, my jaw did drop to the floor. I instantly knew I had to invite a guest to my show, as what I saw and heard was beyond amazing. Luckily, he graciously accepted my invitation, so fasten your seatbelts, folks. My very special guest today is Daniel Drazen. Daniel is an award-winning documentary filmmaker, photographer, and media producer who's been working in this field for over six decades. Since the early 1990s, Daniel has been actively investigating afterlife communication through traditional mental and physical mediumship, as well as modern electronics. He has produced groundbreaking documentaries Calling Earth and Skull, The Afterlife Experiment, which present an irrefutable evidence of the survival of human consciousness after death. He is also the author of A New Science of the Afterlife book, published in June 2023, which we will talk about as well as about these two amazing documentaries, which are in the category of must-see, as far as I'm concerned. Trust me, I have seen them. Hello, Daniel. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's such a pleasure to have you on my show. Well, thank you, Anna. It's a great pleasure for me as well. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> my pleasure. Oh, gosh, I'm thrilled to be able to speak with you. Not long ago, as I mentioned, I was watching your interview on Gaia with Regina Meredith, where they showed a couple of clips from these documentaries that I've mentioned, and my jaw did drop to the floor. And it doesn't happen very often, if ever. So, wow. <laughs> as I said, they are a must-see category of films. But let's start from the beginning. How did you become interested and involved in this field? It's hard to say exactly when, but uh, my interest in the, in the so-called paranormal, and I say so-called because who knows how normal these things are if we can't talk about them comfortably. But my, my first such experiences really took place when I was very young, as a child, when I had a number of precognitive dreams, you know, dreams that came true in one way or another uh, very shortly after the dream. And I didn't I didn't understand what this was. It, it it puzzled me, and I thought it was quite interesting and fascinating, actually. But the, what it did teach me was that in the theater of life, stuff goes on backstage. That there that there are are levels of reality uh, that are not obvious on the surface. 
And we all, we all know that from, you know, simply from Western science for the past 400 years, which has been, you know, probing into levels of nature that are not obvious to our senses. Uh, and this should tell us that there's more, there's always more. So this, this became, a, I sort of integrated this, this perspective into my life as I grew up. I then became quite interested in the question of alien life, uh, became a, 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 an avid student of the whole UFO question. Um, you know, both the phenomena itself and also the fascinating <laughs> political efforts that, that have been underway for decades you know, to try to keep the lid on this. Uh, I'm sure I don't, <laughs> I don't have to tell yeah. your listeners too much about that. But um, so, so that was another aspect uh, of, of reality that taught me that, again, more stuff goes on backstage than we can imagine. So um, long story short, uh, back in the 1990s, I met uh, a gentleman by the name of Mark Macy, who had just written a book about instrumental transcommunication, communication with the other side through electronics. And at first, I was actually uh, a bit skeptical about this, but um, I soon overcame my skepticism after meeting a number of people who practice uh, this form of communication, hearing many of the, uh, of the samples that, that they have recorded over the years. And then I sort of became a student of this phenomenon. In the early 2000s, I teamed up with co-producer Tim Coleman, and uh, we made, uh, I actually made two documentaries together. Um, the first one is Calling Earth, which is about this uh, process of communication, receiving communications from the other side through electronics. Uh, this, as far as we know, the first evidence we have of this uh, came from the 1950s. Now, in the 1950s, tape recorders became consumer items for the first time. And people would, you know, record their playing piano at home, recording their kids' voices. Um, Sunday preachers would record their priceless words of wisdom on tape, and so on. And, um, you know, this, is, this was considered a, a common household appliance at the time. From time to time, people would hear on their tapes faint voices that didn't belong there didn't make sense. They were not heard during the recording process. And uh, in the United States, for the most part, these were dismissed as sort of odd artifact. Well, maybe the machine was picking up a radio station or something like that, and no one paid much attention to it. But in Europe, it was a different story. A number of serious researchers, scientists, physicists, and others became involved in, in analyzing and practicing this form of communication. Uh, the first, as far as we know, was a man named Friedrich Jurgensen. He was a Swede, very much, very well known in his time as uh, an artist, a filmmaker. Uh, he was even an opera singer and writer. And he was, uh, he was in the process of making a documentary at the time. And uh, he went out with his new tape recorder at night to record nocturnal bird sounds. And when he played back the tape in the... Uh, in the pauses between the nocturnal bird sounds, he heard faint voices discussing nocturnal bird sounds. And now this, <laughs> they thought this was quite a coincidence and figure, well, you know, maybe the machine was picking up a radio broadcast of people discussing nocturnal bird sounds. But very soon thereafter, he heard uh, on one of his tapes, um, mm. the voice of his mother calling him by his childhood nickname, Fadidl. Wow. And that really got his attention. So at that point, he said, well, this is something we really need to investigate scientifically. So he spent years collecting uh, these samples. He would simply roll the tape. He would ask a question, leave some blank time on the tape, ask another question, and so forth. And when he played back the tape, most of the time, there would be these faint voices uh, providing plausible answers to his questions. So a few years later, he was joined by a Latvian professor named Konstantin Raudova, who worked with, with Jurgensen for a time, and went off and did his own experiments in, in uh, what's called electronic voice phenomenon, which is a, a subset of this instrumental transcommunication. And uh, Raudova went off, did his own experiments, and by the time he had passed on in 1974, he had recorded between 60 and 70,000 examples of these voices. He had published a, pho a phonograph record that um, reproduced quite a number of these uh, these uh, voices on tape, where he had asked a question, and then the, the and then the response comes, um, and it was quite quite audible and uh, and really fascinating. Then after after uh, 
Radova passed on, he then showed up in the communications of his colleagues. And uh, he had uh, m- most of these uh, electronic voice samples only run a few seconds, two, three, four, maybe five seconds at the most. Uh, it's evidently a very d- difficult phenomenon to pull off from the other side. Uh, they're, they're, who knows what the, what the levels of resistance and uh, you know, f- frequency issues are involved. But Raudava uniquely was able to maintain long conversations, running several minutes. He, he communicated with a friend of mine in Colorado, this Mark Macy, uh, a number of practitioners in Europe. He spoke six languages. Most of the uh, communications we have from him are in English and German. And his speech patterns are quite normal and natural and relaxed and authoritative. So um, this, is, this is evidence that's really quite Im- impossible to, uh, to question or to, un- or to undermine once you, once you really get familiar with the field. So back to the, the uh, film project, Tim Coleman and I uh, went across the United States to three or four European countries over a period of uh, almost 10 years and uh, recorded a, quite a number of interviews with people who have been practitioners in this field. And you can see this all in my, in my documentary, Calling Earth, which is uh, both on Vimeo and uh, we recently put it up on YouTube. So that, that's, the, that's the story in a nutshell. If you have any more questions about it, I'll be glad to, uh, to elaborate. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. We will talk about a number of those aspects in this conversation. And I will, of course, include in the show notes the links to both those movies, to your books and your online presence. I have watched both documentaries. And as I said, they are (laughs) jaw-dropping as far as I'm concerned. I like the quote in your book by Ansel Adams, Mm. legendary photographer. A good photograph is knowing where to stand. (laughs) As a professionally trained photographer myself, I understand that the point of view is everything. It dictates what you will see on the photograph, whether it's a close-up, macro or wide angle, and of course, the position of the camera in relation to the subject. And beautifully, this principle applies to pretty much everything in life, I would suggest as a metaphor for our own individual point of view, our filter with beliefs, assumptions, and expectations. Your book and your documentaries are about, broadly speaking, a proof of the survival of human consciousness after death. What perspective did you choose to present the evidence and the arguments to validate this premise? In other words, what is your point of view? What is your approach to treating this subject matter, which is obviously huge? Well, you might say there's two parts to it. Uh, one is a, the uh, a sort of the spiritual, even the existential point of view, which comes down to the question of whether we are bodies who have souls or souls who have bodies. The normal point of view in our materialistic culture is that we are bodies who may or may not have souls. And at best, we might have a soul. Whatever that is, you know. Um, but from the from a, a metaphysical point of view or a post-materialist point of view, we are souls who have bodies. And uh, I think that our, our everyday experience of life is very different if we come from one one point of view or another. There, my personal point of view, after all these years of of looking into it and and looking into my own experience, is that we are souls who have bodies. And from that point of view, all of all of these metaphysical areas of inquiry make perfect sense. So that, that's what's most comfortable to me, makes the most sense to me, and, and is in accord with my own feelings about life, and my own experiences as well. So, and I'd say the other part of it is that it's important that we, particularly in the Western cultures, begin to bring science to bear on these questions. And not in the sense of, of necessarily what we think of as materialistic science, but the scientific method, which can really be applied to anything. And one of its basic values is that it 
properly conducted, it keeps us from fooling ourselves. Ideally, it gets our egos out of the way. It's not perfect, but it provides a measure of objectivity and it provides food for thought. And I think the, the, um, the whole field of electronic voice phenomena and instrumental transcommunication, which also includes uh, photographs and video and so on from the other side, these provide very, very hard evidence that can be um, analyzed scientifically, evaluated scientifically, and perhaps duplicated scientifically. There are some people who are working on trying to perfect or refine the technology on this side that would presumably make it easier for those on the other side to contact us. I'm agnostic about that. My, my personal view is that what enhances or facilitates this kind of communication has more to do with our emotional connection with those on the other side, and also factors that are really beyond our knowledge. Some people say that this form of communication works best during the waxing phase of the moon or one thing or another. And so let's experiment. Let's try to find out if these are true. And you know, maybe we will stumble on other factors that we haven't considered that will make this this form of communication more more practical and more reliable and and something we can, you know, we can use every day. There's a professor at the University of Western Ontario who's right now, he has a grant to study uh, communications that people have been receiving on their smartphones. And I look forward to the outcome of that study. Oh. A lot of this is in the oh. form of text messages. <laughs> and I've heard many personal stories of people who have received text messages from the other side from folks who are recently deceased. So somehow they're able to, they or some intermediate faculty somehow is enabled yes. to bridge the gap between the the, the realm of consciousness and the material realm. And uh, we know very little about it, but I'm sure we'll learn more to the extent that we're willing to acknowledge the phenomenon that um, foundations and so forth are willing to fund these studies. That's a big thing. Yes. And uh, hopefully we'll just become more comfortable with, with this whole perspective on life and death, which then hopefully will reflect back onto our everyday experience and our personal and social priorities. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Your book, as you mentioned, and your films, your documentaries, are based on science and scientific research. And after having read your book and watched your documentaries, there was just something that struck me. There is no mention or no extended treatment, at least, of the subject of spirituality. So my question is, where is the creator or whatever name you want to use for the highest intelligence in this picture? Where is the spirituality side of it? This raises the question that's the subject of the longest chapter in my book, which is about semantics. What do we mean by creator? What do we mean by God? What do we mean by these various words? Um, I think I've used the word God only once in the book, in this chapter on semantics. And I think that before we can, we can address these questions, uh, I think we have to step, to the extent possible, step back from our traditional definitions and imagery and so forth, and even from some of the tr uh, traditional questions, which may, I think may have to be rephrased and, and, and viewed from a different angle to be able to get to get deeper into them. You, know, you say the word God and every you know, 10 different people will have 10 different images of it. Um, when we say creator, that it tends to, to, to me at least, it, it tends to uh, suggest um, an all-powerful individual. I, I'd say if I, if I have an image or a definition of the creator, it would be something closer to a... Um, a hologram of infinite and eternal extent. I can diverge here just for a moment to uh, suggest that that one possible view of what we call the afterlife or the other side or beyond the veil is that of a sort of a hologram where every every point in that huge picture mm -hmm. is, or every individual ensconced in it, is in some sense also spread out throughout the whole. But with the ability to individualize, to concentrate itself, I, you you're probably familiar with the with holography in our in the, in the 
current yep. sense where you have a photographic mm -hmm. plate and a laser beam and you have interference patterns and so on. And it's a, it's a fascinating thing in its own right, but I think it's also a wonderful metaphor for what happens beyond what we call space and time, which are, are very you know, limited frameworks. If you have ever in any way experienced infinity or eternity in, in a dream, in a psychedelic state or whatever, in meditation, um, I, I think it's, it, it, it becomes obvious after a while that our sort of hard-coded, delimited notion of the physical world is really just a subset of something that's, that's much freer and more creative and um, less frozen in space and time, you might say. And I think that, that that is the realm in which our consciousness plays. And when I say our consciousness, from my perspective, we all participate in it. To the extent that we are conscious, we are part of that larger reality. We're sort of individual points of focus in it, but that we all participate in it. And that, to me, the nature of consciousness is completely formless. It's it's arbitrary until the creative principle gets going, and then you have dimensions and and you know um, physical yeah. uh, creations and planets yeah. and animal, vegetable, and mineral. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's one reason why I, I prefer not to stick to conventional language, and would would much rather kind of shake things up in in hopefully a more um, powerful and less traditional way. Yes. And just to clarify, I don't mean to hang up on particular words or language because we all know that our language is very limited and is very uh, prescriptive. What I meant by asking where is the creator or spirituality in this picture that you have painted is more about the other side of science. For example, the motto for my show is at the intersection of science and spirituality. So my definition of the creator is all that is, or better still, the highest intelligence. Because I think by now most scientists even have agreed that there is an underpinning intelligence in the universe. At least this is a prevailing school of thought, as I understand. It is not some haphazard event because it is too well organized. So there is an underlying and underpinning intelligence in it. So that's what I'm referring to, not God as taught by some religions, you know, an individual or power that is more defined, but all that is. And some spiritual schools of thought refer to the creator God as all that is, which I think uh, represents that consciousness, intelligent, highly intelligent consciousness from which all has been created, all has come. That was my angle, if you like, <laughs> but thank you for explaining. To me, what each of us has said is simply a different expression of the same thing. Yeah. Yes. That, that there is, that there is a, a universal intelligence, universal conscience, consciousness, from which a universal intelligence has emerged, and that that intelligence uh, has been playing creative games with itself for all of eternity. Yes, and this is this is the, the question of infinity and, and eternity is something that's really gotten to fascinate me in, in recent years because I quite unexpected unexpectedly had an experience of eternity. Uh, I was just sitting at my desk watching a YouTube video one day. And without going into so much, without a lot of detail about it, I suddenly found myself experiencing eternity. And on one side of my brain was was counting the seconds. It happened for about thirty seconds of of Earth time, you might say. But the the rest of my awareness was just um, stunned. And the the only thing I could say to myself was, "Oh my God, eternity is not merely an infinite extension of time." It's something absolutely and completely different. Now, this realization of, of the eternal or the, the boundless 
is beginning to sneak up on our culture in some interesting ways. The James Webb Space Telescope, for example, has been out there for, for, not, for not very much time now, and it's beginning to lay waste to a lot of preconceptions about how the physical universe was created. But it's also done another interesting thing that, as I understand it, there has been a, a very quiet branch of cosmology that's called eternalism. It's been around for a while, but hasn't really shown its face very much. And my understanding is that the eternalists are beginning to come out of the woodwork now and say, there may be no beginning and no end. And that is challenging to our minds because our minds have to slice and dice things, measure them, <laughs> create beginnings and ends, whether they're there or not, you know, in, in order to, to package them for our human comprehension. But beyond the, beyond the realm of human comprehension, there's probably still plenty of comprehension left, and that that level of comprehension can be very comfortable with the notion of eternity. And um, I, I think for that reason, you know, those on what we call the other side are much more tuned in to things like past lives, past civilizations, other civilizations, and so on. It's just no big deal over there. Yes. And um, I'm, for, forgive me for using the expression over there because th that's another kind of spatial metaphor. I work, with a, I work with a talented team of mediums who are always reminding me that uh, our friends on the other side aren't often some distant realm in the sky. They're all around us. Just as you, know, as, as you and I are sitting here in, in our homes, there are a thousand radio and television broadcasts and wireless communications going through our room and through our bodies at all times, but they don't exist. You know? so, and this, this raises the question of what's the veil? We speak, we speak about you know, the other side is beyond the veil. What's the veil? As far as I'm concerned, the veil is our senses, our physical senses. And, you know, ultraviolet light is beyond the veil in the same sense that heaven is beyond, <laughs> is beyond our senses. You know, once we start thinking in terms of different frequencies or levels of reality, this, I think this clears up a lot of the mystery. And I think, and I hope that it changes our language a bit, that to become a little more, um, you know, perhaps a, a, a little less um, traditional, a little less anthropomorphized and, and, and more open and 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 that would would stimulate us to actually experience things in a different way. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, in relation to that sense of eternity that you spoke about, I have a feeling that this is the the zone that we can go into. For example, when we are engrossed in some creative activity or even in meditation, when we can lower our brain waves down to the theta state, in which we can experience that no space, no time, no personality, simply pure consciousness in the whole of creation, the whole being. Because that, that's the uh, point where, where there is no time, no space, just a sense of belonging, a sense of being part of the greater consciousness or the great reality, as you call it. So are we talking about the same thing here? Because this is, this, when I go into the zone or in my meditation, that's exactly the space that I find myself in, where there is no beginning and no end. That, that, yes, that, that would represent sort of the, the other extreme of where we are normally are, are in our sensibilities and our civilization and so on. That would be the other pole of it. Um, there is also in between the two levels of relative reality that um, you know, those of us who study this field are, are familiar with. Um, those who communicate from the afterlife, for example, they're in sort of what I would call one of the intermediate levels where they have both uh, a greater sense of the eternal, but also a connection with with manifest reality, with our physical world, with human connections, and so on. Uh, there are those, for example, um, I work, uh, this team of mediums that I mentioned that I work with, um, we often do, we're located in different parts of the country, and so we often have Zoom meetings. And um, our meetings are often crashed by none other than Robin Williams. Who is <laughs> really? A, who, 
really. He's actually working with a lot of mediums, but he's worked with us. Wow. And he can be incredibly hilarious. I mean, you can't make him up. And then he can get very, very serious. And he's told us about his own struggles when he was, when he was alive here with his disease, with his family, and so on. And um, he's, he says that he has chosen to stay close to the earth plane and that he feels that his mission in doing so is to help us lighten up, God's sake, and, and stop taking life so seriously. It's, and it's, I, I could go on and on about this, but that's, that's basically the idea, that there are some folks who, who leave this earth plane uh, and go on to higher, more subtle levels. Others choose to stick around to be of, of assistance to us in our own involvement, and uh, sometimes even in, our, in some of the practical aspects of our lives. I live, I, speaking of Robin Williams, um, I live in Marin County, California, which is just north of San Francisco, just over the Golden Gate Bridge. And there's a, a tunnel in the freeway there that was after Robin Williams uh, died. It was named after him. It's the Robin Williams Tunnel. So in one, of these, in one of these contacts, I said to him, I said, you know, every time I drive through this tunnel, I think of you. And he says, oh, the tunnel. He says, every time, he says, I love standing in the middle of the tunnel with my arms outstretched and watching the cars go through me. <laughs> now, you, you, you can't make this up. So, yeah, and he, he and others have, uh... have, have uh, kind of elbowed their way into our, into our um, meetings. And I've spoken to others as well. I recently met uh, a young woman who's an attorney, a practicing attorney, and she's been discovering her own uh, mediumship talents. And Robin Williams has come to her as well uh, with a lot of detailed information. So, you know, we, we're, I feel privileged to have a, a sort of a ringside seat at, at some of these developments of um, what I used to call paranormal. I, I, I don't know what's paranormal anymore because we don't, you know, <laughs> If we can't talk about it again, how, how do we know what's normal or not? Yes. I think people are, are feeling somewhat more at ease now in talking about it. And so we're finding that it's, it's a lot more common than we, than we might think. Whether you are seeking professional guidance and support in getting through the challenges of life, or would like to better understand how life really works, why not consider one of my Quantum Living transformative programs? Quantum Shift, Healing Emotional Addictions, Healing Relationships, Finding Your Mojo, or Quantum Living Mentoring Program, my newest edition. They are all based on quantum science and metaphysics, my extensive coaching experience, quantum wisdom, energy healing, and psychic insights. Please visit quantumliving.com.au for more information and contact details. Let's have a chat how I could help you find what you are looking for. You'll be glad you did. I think one of the reasons is that people are, or people tend to be afraid of things they don't understand, which is, a, I guess, a natural psychological response. What we don't understand, what, what is unfamiliar to us, we are very cautious because we don't really know how to deal with it. So I feel that this is one of the reasons for, uh, if you like, resistance or, or separation between the normal, what we know very well and understand and can and live it and deal with it, versus concepts and situations and ideas and phenomena that we can't understand with our five main physical senses. I think it's now a good point to share my own experience. Please. <laughs> and I would be curious to hear your view on this. Just as a background, I am fairly psychic or I have a very good intuition and I'm open psychically in various ways. But this was very unusual. It happened several years ago. I was working on my computer and I have, which is a desktop PC, and I always have external speakers connected to my computer. And I remember that I fin I was just typing something. I, I finished working and I got up. I had no music on. There was no media running, nothing. I was just in Word typing some document. I got up and then I heard a voice coming from the computer speakers, loud and crystal clear. Hello. 
with this sort of intonation, hello, but just once. It was a male voice, and I would characterize it as a handsome voice, if you like. <laughs> and I froze. And then I asked, I said, hello, hello, who are you? Hello. And then I said, you know, said a few other things, just in inviting conversation. Please talk to me. Please talk to me. <laughs> and there was silence. So I kept talking <laughs> to my computer for the next 50 minutes or so, hoping that this, the source of this voice comes back and engages in a conversation with me. But it was just a single, but very clear, very loud, hello, in male voice. And for some reason, I got an insight or a thought at that point that they were time traveler and just somehow got energetically connected uh, with my device, if you like, and they were looking for communication. But beyond that one hello, which was, as I said, with an intonation, seeking response, seeking anyone there, <laughs> hello, and there was just one. And I was so upset <laughs> that they were gone and didn't want to you know, keep talking to me. <laughs> what do you think? Mm. Well, I, I wouldn't be too sure that they didn't want to keep talking to you. See, we don't understand the process. We don't understand how this happens. We don't understand. Sometimes I use the metaphor of uh, let's say there are two railroad trains traveling on tracks that are not quite parallel. They converge and diverge and converge and diverge. And there's only one open window in each train. And the and the the trick is to to throw a spitball between one open window in one train into the other, right? On those rare moments when the when the two windows happen to be, you know, aligned. <laughs> I think that's part of the picture. That that we're dealing with, with energy <laughs> systems that are foreign enough to our own. It makes sense. That, um you know, depending on on which way the etheric breeze is blowing, if you want to put it that way, uh, communication will be more or less possible. Mm -hmm. In the Skoll experiment, which we can talk about for a minute, which is the subject of my other documentary, mm -hmm. one of the folks on the other side communicating with the team on this side, he, this is someone who was able to make his voice just come out of thin air, not through technology or through the mediums. He was able to just project his voice out of the air and and he was asked, uh, you know, how do you do this? And he says, well, you know, I think in a language that I'm familiar with, and by some miracle, the voice is, is transmitted into your room. And it, but he added, it says, not by me, but by entities whose job it is to do that. Wow. So there may be, at least in some instances, um, those uh, entities who are able to bridge that that gap in frequency or whatever you want to call it. Again, we we understand so little about the mechanisms, but we do know how to to enhance the the possibility of this kind of communication occurring. All else being equal, if you have a, an emotional bond with someone on the other side, if you try to make contact at the same time of day every day, try to set up patterns that are likely to be more perceptible to those on the other side that your the possibility of making this communication happen uh, will be enhanced. But I think that's all we can say at this point. We we understand some of the conditions that we can set up. Who knows? And maybe certain geographical areas are more are, are are more susceptible to this this kind of phenomenon. You know, if if this were much more acceptable to the scientific community, we'd probably know by now. That you know, there there would be you know huge sources of funding for for research and experimentation in these areas. We're not there yet, obviously. Just speaking of the skull experiment, I did want to mention that while we still have time, then this is the subject of the other documentary that I did with Tim Coleman. Skull experiment is an experiment in physical mediumship that took place uh, in the latter, mostly in the latter half of the 1990s, in a uh, tiny town in England called Skoll. It's in the county of Norfolk, about a half hour northeast of Cambridge. And um, in that village, in a particular uh, wonderful old 17th century farmhouse, um, where there was a very quiet old wine cellar, these two couples were able to create an environment where for a period of almost five years, uh, and in, they did 500 sessions sitting around this particular 
table in this in this cellar, uh, and they managed to have an enormous um, enormous success in, in contacting commu- communicating with the team on the other side, with whom they worked in concert to develop experiments in communi- communication between the realms. And these included, you know, not just mediumistic communication, but physical manifestations, uh, voices, which I had mentioned that just came right out of the mm-hmm. air, not through the mediums. They did a series of, of um, ex- electronic experiments. Um, this is during a period where, the, for, for two years, this experiment was monitored by um, three uh, experts from the British Society for Psychical Research. And these were were properly skeptical investigators. They they they'd heard and seen it all, and yet they they could find absolutely no no evidence of any tampering or fakery or any anything like that. They also were curious about some of these uh, experiments that that the the team was was uh, attempting. One of which involved using a little tape recorder from which the microphone had been removed, so there'd be no chance of recording any sounds from the room. And yet they were receiving voices through this tape recorder. They were then advised how to build a device which would enhance the communications, which it did to some extent. And then when they asked, is there a way to improve this device still further, they received a message in a most interesting way. Part of their experimentation was using photographic film, unexposed photographic film, which um, those on the other side would impress writing and pictures and poems and wonderful drawings and puzzles. You've seen that in the, in the documentary. Yes. <laughs> so the, the question was asked, how can we improve this device? So what appeared on the next roll of photographic film was a diagram showing how to improve this device. And it was signed with the letters T-A-E, which were an exact match to Thomas Alva Edison's signature. Wow. So presumably the uh, the spirit of Edison was uh, was uh, lurking behind the scenes and and lending his uh, his expertise to the enterprise there, and it goes on and on. And this this was documented in in my film called Skull: The Afterlife Experiment, which you which you have seen. Yes, and that was the moment that made my jaw drop to the floor when I saw that on the blank tape under very strict monitoring and conditions when the tape was developed, and it is shown in in the movie, there is a string of writings, photographs, graphics. I mean, (laughs) that's the moment when my brain froze. And if someone, after seeing this, and as you said, this has been documented and 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 uh, reported, uh, etc. If someone, after seeing this and accepting this as a fact, in other words, there was no tampering, uh, there was nothing, you know, funny going on. To me, this in itself is an irrefutable evidence. You can't refute it. It wasn't there, and then there was. <laughs> So if someone, after seeing this, still claims that, oh, you know, there was a fluke or whatever, there's no such thing as interdimensional communication, well, I think they need to think again, because this is irrefutable. And this, in fact, is a very nice segue to my next question. As you said in your book, the landscape of afterlife research includes several phenomena, such as NDE, reincarnation, life between lives, mediumship, uh, out-of-body experience, and instrumental transcommunication and many others. The main difference that I can see amongst all those avenues, if you like, is that some experiences are subjective to the experiencer, while others can be objectively tested. And instrumental transcommunication, obviously, is in, is a good example in this category. So my question is, when looking at those two groups, if you like, of uh, phenomena, in your view, are some more reliable as evidence of such phenomena than others in terms of objectivity and subjectivity? Well, um, certainly in terms of objectivity, 
um, the ones that can be objectively demonstrated are, are uh, you know, obviously uh, more solid evidence or proof, if you will. Uh, but the same thing is true in our physical lives. We have many subjective experiences. I mean, I can't prove that I had a certain dream last night, but enough of us have dreams that uh, we can relate to at least to the to the existence of the phenomenon. So, in that sense, I think that we're not as aware that that question exists in our normal lives, but it does. You know, I mean, I, there's no there's no way that I can know how you experience anything. We have a an, an arena of objective exchange and phenomena. I think you you and I both agree that we can see each other on on Zoom right now. But I have no idea how you perceive me or your environment or anything. I have no idea what your memories are like. It's you know there, there's there's what we perceive and there's also what we notice or don't notice. And this is something I get into in my book briefly. That um, you know I I mentioned that I um, there's a a street that I've driven on thousands of times, and only last year did I notice a particularly remarkable tree that's been growing by that by that street. For decades, and I never noticed it. <laughs> and then one day, for some reason, I noticed it. And now that tree is real to me. It was not real to me before. Yeah. So this also gets into the question of yeah, this is get, gets into the question of how we define reality. And uh, this is something in my chapter on semantics. Is I take a I take a crack at at defining reality, and I won't I won't give it away right now. But uh, I think it's a, it's a very important thing to. Um, to question, because we use words like that, you know, you take, take any two people who disagree about anything, and you'll find that they have different definitions of reality. <laughs> so many arguments and, and, and diversities of opinion have to do with language. So I think we need to start, start seeing through that. I mean, we can't, you know, we can't discard language. We, we need it, at least so far. But I think language is, is, can be as much of an impediment uh, as anything else. When I think I think those of us who are, who are at all bilingual, for example, uh, can appreciate that some languages have words for things that other languages don't. Yes, yeah, absolutely. When you you hear some bilingual over here in a cafe, uh, some bilingual people conversing, very often they'll switch from one language to another because one language expresses something better, or or may actually have an expression for something that the other one completely lacks. So that's, I think, one, one of the ways in which we need to expand our consciousness is to, to take a look back at what we, think, what we think of as ordinary in our lives and you know, look at it with some, with some objectivity and question you know, the way we've arranged our reality. Is that the only way to arrange reality? I don't think so. Yes. <laughs> Yes, very, very good point. Thank you. I have um, one more question about mediumship, which is perhaps somewhat controversial, but I am aware that a number of people share my view on this, if you like. And that is, I know that channeling and mediumship are real from my own experience and, and from my own understanding of, of these phenomena. But I have to say that I am always skeptical about someone claiming that they channel a specific entity or group of entities, which they identify by their name, for example. And I must say that I feel this is, or this can be often just for marketing and commercial purposes, because if you say that you channel, um, say, Archangel Michael, or an entity X, Y, Z, you are more likely to get followers and, uh, you know, a lucrative business of channeling sessions than if you said that you are channeling the spirit or your higher self. And I, I don't mean to be, uh, you know, critical or, or dismissive of those channels who choose to identify their source of information, but I am always skeptical. So. What is your view on this? Well, it's a very good question. And um, it's something that I run into all the time myself. 
And I think, I don't know that there's a single blanket answer to that. I think probably several different things are going on. I think from the other side, if there is a, a teacher or a presence or a team that wants to get certain points across, they may, uh, they may engage in some uh, what I call benevolent masquerading to add authority to their, to their presence in some way, depending on who's receiving it and, and who would respond to that, that identity. Well, I'm, I'm saying in some cases, in some cases, there may be misinformation being, being transmitted. And um, in other cases, perhaps something completely different beyond our conception is going on. Okay. I think the bottom line for us is to treat it the same way we, as we would treat information from human beings. You know, try it on for size, see if it fits right, if it feels right. Um, you know, try acting on it and see what happens. And if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. I, I don't think, um, you know, so-called dark spirits are capable of much more mischief than humans are. God knows. So, um, you know, I think if we, if we think of, of these things in, in a more ordinary rather than extraordinary way, uh, that, will be, that will be more wisely guided. Obviously, for, for those of us who, who can't directly see beyond the veil, as it were, um, you know, some caution and discernment is always uh, advisable. You know, if, if, if individuals are, are going to use their positions of authority to be manipulative, They'll probably, you know, call in the right spirits to uh, to further that enterprise. You know, not 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 everyone on the other side is, you know, wears wings. So everything comes down to our own discernment in, in our ordinary life and in in probing into these other areas. We, we need food tasters <laughs> to to give us just a you know a, a tiny bit <laughs> of, of this, see if it feels right, and then proceed. And if we get if we see any red flags, then back off. It's just you know. That, that's just how this common sense, I would say, is is the best teacher there. And again, if if we think if we think of this as as esoteric or 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 holy, uh, we are likely to suspend our our normal sense of of discernment. Absolutely. We don't, we don't want to give authority to any any external agency, no matter what it calls itself. And I think the more the more we do that, the more we're likely to be approached by those beings and entities and spirits and human beings. That are, you know, are are genuinely interested in everyone's well-being. Absolutely, that's a very good point. Now, I found in your book an elegant explanation of the question I've been grappling with for many years, <laughs> which is: if souls keep reincarnating, how is it possible to communicate with someone who passed, say, five hundred years ago? And would have reincarnated, hopefully, <laughs> or possibly a few times since then. And so there are, let's say, five different personalities of the soul within that time frame. And what you said in your book is that a soul, while incarnating, always remains in the greater reality as a fragment containing the memories and personality of each incarnation, which can independently communicate with people on this side. Could you please elaborate on this? Because I know that many people ask this question, how is it possible? From my perspective, and I could be wrong, uh, the soul as a whole, your soul, my soul, doesn't really have boundaries as such, right? or it has a, a very permeable boundaries, you might say. So the the identity of a given soul may itself have a certain flexibility to it. Uh, those aspects of it that reincarnate and then are, are drawn back would seem to add to the sum total of the soul's experience. And as, as these continue more, more and more reincarnations, the experiences are absorbed into the whole of the soul. That's how I tend to view it rather than fragments. When we address someone, say a, a, a loved one of ours who passes, and we make contact with them by whatever means, the aspect that we're most familiar is the one that will resonate with us quite naturally. But depending on how long they've been over there, uh, they could be more and more integrated into their greater self and be capable of giving us a wide variety of information, both about their lifetime just lived and about others. For example, I, my late partner Jane, who passed in 2007, 
I've had several conversations with her through two trusted mediums since then. And her progress has been interesting. Um, in, in the first short period after she passed, I was physically aware of her presence because I would, like at the end of the day, I'd be in the kitchen washing, washing up and she would always be there standing next to me and I could feel it. And I would have this strong tingling on the right side of my head when she was present. It was really quite something. Sometimes I thought the top of my head was going to come <laughs> off. So that happened for a period of time. And then um, she was, then at a certain point, she was no longer that that close to the earth plane, that, that accessible. And in several conversations I've had with her through these mediums, uh, I learned about her, you know, who her, where her sense of identity kind of shifted from being more oriented toward the earth plane to moving then into what we call the life review, more insight about the experiences of the life just lived, and then into a, a larger domain after that. So I, I, I sort of see these various aspects and, and sets of experiences of the self as sort of nested within one another, uh, that none of these are ever lost. The, I think the most important question here, again, comes back to, are, you know, are we bodies who have souls or souls who have bodies? And if we, if we come from the point of view of um, souls that have bodies, and perhaps more than one body at the same time, which we're, which we're told occurs as well, I think what I'm saying is that our, our human minds are not quite prepared to encompass the ontology of this. That all we can do is put labels on it that are familiar yes. to us. I, that, that may be a very indirect way of answering your question, but it may be, I think it's the best we can do. We're, we're just learning right now. Our, we as individuals, uh, and of course our culture as a whole, is just you know, beginning to put better labels on, on all these yes. things. And I think this will continue to evolve over the next decades and hopefully centuries, where the, the, two, the two sides of the veil, as it were, will become closer, more accessible to one another. And perhaps at a certain point, it will all become one thing. That would be my hope, and I, I, I think I'm, I'm accurately perceiving a trend in that direction. But that's just that's just my perception. You yeah, know. I agree. And what you have just said absolutely resonates with me and, and makes sense. It absolutely makes sense. So thank you. And again, I encourage everyone interested in this topic, even remotely at this point in time, to get hold of your book and read the book and absolutely watch those two documentaries. And I will include the links in the show notes. Before we start wrapping up, Dan, I have just one final point or question that I would like to put to you. I absolutely love the concept in your book of paradise islands in the ocean of consciousness that can be anything created by the souls with thought and intention, as this again makes perfect sense to me and validates various messages from the other side that we receive about the lifestyle, for the lack of a better word, <laughs> of the souls living on the other side, which, is, which they often describe as just like here on earth. So the, this concept of creating those realities, those paradise islands, exactly the way as the souls want to create with thought and intention, I find absolutely fascinating. And my question here is, uh, because it's, it's so evocative, <laughs> and I already know what my paradise island I would want to create once they passed over. But my question here is, where did this specific information come from? Can you recall? Well, I think m many, many of those who, who speak about life on the other side um, have, have told us about you know, levels of the afterlife where uh, souls uh, engage in uh, communal creative efforts of, of you know, working together towards a, you know, a, a mutually recognized goal. Some of these creations uh, mimic uh, the physical, uh, are their physical lives that they that they recall on Earth, cities, towns, and set etc. Um, that uh, look and feel very much the same as they did here. Some may may choose to co-create rural environments. Some purely creative abstract environments. As uh, I think you've you've probably seen, um, uh, what's the film that that Robin Williams? Uh, 
starred in uh, What Dreams May Come, where the whole, the whole environment was like a, a living painting, for example, as there is in any field of art. We're talking about fields of unlimited creation. Some may may exist for millions of our years, and others may may be created just to see what they feel like, and then blow them up and start something new. So I think I think probably our own arts, our graphic arts, our performing arts, may give us a clue as to what can happen directly in consciousness without having to deal with the uh, without physical materials and the limitations of the physical world. There is. Uh, are you familiar with Leslie Flint? He was a British. A uh, very famous British medium. You you can Google this up on the internet. He he did a long channeling once of um, Frederick Chopin, and was a, a well known classical composer. And it's a wonderful. You know, he describes his experience of going to the other side and and perceiving himself inside this huge concert hall with this beautiful piano, and and you know performing for the crowd, and so on and so on. Um, I I think we can. You know, we can replicate any familiar physical environment we want individually and collectively. We can create things that have never existed. And if we want, we can create nothing at all. We can just go into infinity and, and eternity where there is no structure. So it's all, you know, it's all at the at the behest of the of the soul and what the soul is inclined to do. Uh, and it's uh, like what it's to say about the other side, it's a free country. And uh uh, I, th- I think if if our own if our own politics were more modeled on how things happen on the other side, we would have freer countries in general. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, I agree with you. And I feel that uh, one of the key takeaways from this concept is that our thought and intention do create our reality, even on this side. I would agree. Beautiful. <laughs> uh, any final thoughts before we close? Oh, I don't know. I just, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. This has been a wonderful, uh, uh, a wonderful hour spent, hour plus spent together. I appreciate the questions you've asked. Um, I appreciate the 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 thoroughness with which you have um, uh, read my book and watched the documentaries. Uh, not not many people have done that, and uh, that that's that's very special. And and uh, uh, all I can say is to keep up the good work. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, not only what I have read and saw, not only has validated a lot of my own assumptions and, and my own thinking and understanding, but as I said at the beginning, to me, what you captured on your documentary is an irrefutable evidence of the survival of human consciousness after death. I would agree. Thank you. Wonderful, Dan. So thank you so very much for this amazing conversation, this amazing dialogue, and thank you for your work. So please keep doing what you do. And I would love to hear about your new projects, new books, because this is the area of our life that we absolutely need to learn much more about. So thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to have you on Quantum Living. Well, it's been a pleasure and thank you so much, Anna, and and blessings to you for your work as well. That's so important. Thank you so much. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me, and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.